Um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome our first speaker, Ray Goldstein, who was the GK Bachelor Prize winner in 2016. Uh, Ray has really advanced the study of fluid mechanical interactions with and within biological organisms using state-of-the-art experimentation on small scales. I'm very pleased that he's opening the scientific proceedings for us today uh, with a talk whose short title is Two Stories of Fluids and Light, and whose long title I won't <coughs> attempt to pronounce. Um, I'm sure that he'll both entertain and educate us in his usual style. So over to you, Ray. Uh, thank you very much, Gray, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, it really is a pleasure to speak at this commemoration of George Batchelor's uh, enormous contributions to science. It's slightly intimidating to have to be the first speaker. I should say that um, unlike many of you, I never actually met George. And so my understanding of him as a scientist and in particular as a person is mostly come by osmosis at morning tea and damped over the last 15 years since I uh, moved to Cambridge. And, but one of the things for which I'm really most grateful to him is the strong emphasis that he placed on having an experimental laboratory in Damped. And so in my talk this afternoon, I thought it was appropriate to spend most of my time illustrating how such experimental work can help answer questions in biology. Now, for many of the organisms of the microscopic world, the two most important aspects of their environment are the fluids they move in and the light that powers photosynthesis. But for others, light is an important output of cellular metabolism. And my talk will try to link these two uh, aspects uh, of organisms. The first half will focus on the phenomenon of phototaxis uh, exhibited by green algae, basically trying to understand how organisms that lack a central nervous system can nevertheless control their moving parts and exhibit collective di directed motion. The second half will focus on understanding the bioluminescence of marine microorganisms that's triggered by fluid motion. Now, the issue of phototaxis plays an important role in the evolutionary origins of multicellularity as indicated by the two central organisms that I show here. So on the left, you see an organism known as Chlamydomonas. It's a green alga, about 10 microns across. Remember, if you're fortunate to have some hair, uh, a typical uh, hair follicle is about uh, 100 microns across. Uh, and so we're talking about very small organisms. As you see, it's possessed of two sort of 10 or 15 micron long uh, flagella, which are conceptually like the cilia in your lungs. And they beat in this case at about 50 or 60 Hertz, powering this organism through its fluid environment. And it is an ancestor, or maybe you want to say a cousin, of Volvox, a uh, much larger organism shown on the right, which consists of up to a thousand cells on its surface held together by a transparent extracellular matrix. And each of the cells on the surface is conceptually like Chlamydomonas. It has two flagella that beat and power it through its fluid environment. But in this case, there are two types of cells. There are these galley slaves on the outside who uh, power uh, motility, and all the reproduction is sequestered on the inside in specialized reproductive cells that grow up to become the daughter colonies. Now, both of these organisms have on their cells, either in the single cell of Chlamydomonas or in the somatic cells on the surface of Volvox carteri, specialized photodetectors, photosensors known as eye spots, which allow them to see light in their fluid environment and to swim toward it by modulating the beating of the flagella that I've just been discussing. In Chlamydomonas, it's fairly straightforward to understand roughly how they do this phototaxis and steer toward the light. But when you look at Volvox, it's a bit of a mystery. This is an organism that has no central nervous system. It's basically a thousand independent players, weakly coupled, perhaps hydrodynamically, but basically independent objects that somehow collectively allow this organism to steer toward the light. And what I want to focus on is a sort of decade-long story of how we've studied these two organisms and a third one to try to understand the evolutionary physical principles that allow this first step in the ladder of developing multicellular organisms. Now, just to give you an idea about how these photosensors work, they're really quite amazing things. So let's, let's look at what's known in the case of Chlamydomonas. So here we have the organism shown, the wild type, the standard form you find in the environment. The eye spot is uh, shown as blue. It's a bunch of uh, biochemical receptors that, that uh, uh, trigger an internal uh, electrochemical changes that modulate the beating of the flagella when light falls on them. But as shown in this diagram, just behind that blue eye spot, there is a red protein layer that is essentially a shield. It prevents light from the backside of the organism getting to the eye spot, which means the organism looks, in a sense, forward and not back. 
And so as it moves through its environment, it turns out it rotates about its body fixed axis, which means that if that axis is not lined up with the light, then it actually gets a periodic signal on its uh, eye spot as it moves in and out of direct uh, line of sight to the, to the light. Now, interestingly, the people who wrote this uh, recent paper in uh, PNAS uh, were studying a mutant. It's called ILIS for a, a strange reason. It does actually have a photosensor, but it's missing that protein layer behind it, which means actually it gets light from the front and the back. But amazingly, the cell body acts as a lens. So when light comes from behind, it's actually focused more strongly on the backside than on the front side, <clears throat> which shows because this organism actually goes the wrong way when confronted with light the very importance of having this uh, directional sensor on it. Now, in the case of uh, Volvox, if you look down on the north pole of this organism at all those individual somatic cells, you can see the eye spot if you have the right kind of microscope, these nice red dots that are very much uh, organized in a geometric pattern, uh, looking essentially down and out uh, over this sphere. And in fact, if you, if you smush a uh, Volvox organism against a glass microscope slide, and then you draw a little arrow from the center of each cell to the eye spot, you can see from the highly organized structure of these arrows that there's a lot of directional orientational orders, something often called planar cell polarity in biology, so that all these sensors are looking out and down from the North Pole to the South Pole of the organism. And so that's the sort of setting of how we want to try to understand how a bunch of uh, cells like this can orchestrate collective behavior of a colony. Now here's Volvox uh, in, in its natural environment swimming around and you'll notice, uh, maybe you realize from its name uh, related to the Latin root volvare to spin or roll that as it moves it spins. And this is a common feature of all of these green algae and in fact many other organisms that are photosensitive that they swim while spinning and essentially move in helical paths. And one of the really deep questions in this field, which I'll touch on a few times here, is why bother spinning? What is the advantage of spinning? How does that in any way relate to the ability to do phototaxis? But you'll see this, this beautiful swimming motion. These organisms, again, are half a millimeter across and uh, covered with uh, 2,000 of these flagella. So when we want to try to understand these organisms, we can track them in their swimming in three dimensions, but it turns out to be much more useful to actually hold them still using the te technique of micropipette immobilization, borrowed basically from the world of in vitro fertilization, to hold them for interrogation under the microscope and to try to understand in the case of Volvox on the left, where you can just make out all of its flagella on the surface, or in the case of Chlamydomonas on the right, where you can very clearly see its flagella, what they're doing in response to these light signals. And the way we do that in the GK Bachelor Laboratory uh, is essentially standard uh, high-speed imaging microscopy in which we use these micropipettes, one or several, if we want to direct light through a fiber optic light guide or shoot fluid at it to see what it does, uh, into a, a, a specialized chamber uh, sitting above the objective of a, an inverted microscope and to do the standard kinds of image processing that are necessary to try to uh, tease out what's happening with these flagella. So uh, the first story then is going to be about Volvox. It, it started 10 years ago with my then student, uh, PhD student Knut Drescher and postdoc uh, Idan Tuval. Uh, and it was coincident with some uh, uh, related work on a completely different kind of organism uh, that came to very similar conclusions to what we were uh, finding in Volvox. So here we have again the organism. Remember, it spins about a body fixed axis. Its fluid, uh, its flagella drive fluid flow from the North Pole to the South Pole. and uh, we want to understand how it responds to light as it spins around in its fluid environment. But we're, instead of letting it swim freely, we're going to hold it fixed and we're going to bring an optical fiber up next to it and turn that on and off at different frequencies, not different frequencies of light, different frequencies of on and off to study the temporal response of the flow around this organism to try to get a sense of how uh, things uh, change in time. And so here's, a, here's an old movie that uh, will show you basically what's going on. So here's the micropipette, here's a Volvox colony. We've got microspheres in here uh, to let you see the flow. You can't make out at this scale the individual flagella, but if I start the video, uh, you'll see the nice uh, flow that is generated uh, splits on the two sides around the organism. The light is off, now the light is on, and you see right at the pole there that the flow slowed down. This is pretty much real time. So after a few seconds though, it recovers. And that kind of, let's call it adaptive response in which when first confronted with a signal, one shuns it, closes your eyes, whatever, and then slowly recovers is the key to this whole process. Uh, 
It's very much similar to what happens if you have a sharp smell that you suddenly detect. Your nose uh, tells you it's there, but within a few minutes, you uh, get used to it. So if you use particle image velocimetry, for instance, to understand what the fluid flow in the neighborhood of some point on the surface looks like as you went from turning the light off to the light on, you can see in red here the sort of mean behavior. There's a very rapid downregulation of the beating of the flagella so that the fluid flow drops a lot on the scale of a fraction of a second. And then over the course of several seconds, it recovers back to its original behavior. So this is a standard adaptive response with two characteristic time scales, uh, a response time scale and an adaptation time scale. Now, when you look at this, you might think, oh, this is some kind of complicated nonlinear system. Maybe it's a bit like uh, excitable media, cardiac dynamics, action potentials, things like that. But it turns out not, actually. It turns out it's essentially a perfectly linear system. And it can be described by a very simple model, which is going to turn out to play a role in all of the parts of my talk today. It's a, it's a phenomenological model, but one which has been used successfully, not only in this problem, but also in bacterial chemotaxis and, and many other areas in cellular biophysics. And it works like this. Let's imagine that the signal that we see is called the photoresponse P. And the signal that we impose, uh, the light being on or off, is called S. What we have is a, a dynamics in which there's a fundamental observable P and a response uh, and a hidden variable H, which is, stands for all the other biochemistry that we can't see. And the dynamics is basically that uh, P, the variable of interest, responds to the difference between the signal and this hidden variable, uh, and H responds to the difference between itself and S. So if we start with H equals S equals P equals zero, everything is quiescent, and we suddenly turn on a signal, then what happens is on a short time scale, when there's no H, P tries to evolve to that signal and becomes large, as you see here, on a time scale of tau response. But on a longer time scale, the hidden variable comes into motion, tries to become equal to S, that makes P go to the difference between the two and relax back. So you get this biphasic response. It's basically like two capacitors charging and discharging. And the picture that one would have is that the fluid velocity anywhere on the surface would be whatever it was before with a correction associated with this P variable. And we want to see whether this is just at least an encoding of what happens experimentally. So if you watch again, the azimuthal velocity around this organism as a function of angle and as a function of time after you turn on the light, Initially, you have some profile that looks like this. It's basically a fundamental mode, not unlike a squirmer model a velocity field. Uh, and then if you uh, watch a few hundred milliseconds later and later, you'll see that the fluid velocity in the north, northern hemisphere of the organism drops quite a bit and then recovers back. And in the southern hemisphere, it doesn't really change much at all. So basically, the top half of the organism has this down-regulated beating and then recovery. Now, as I said, we can change the on and off frequency of this light and try to see uh, what response we get. And what we get is incredibly interesting. It's a kind of resonance curve. So here's the normalized photoresponse. It's just a measure of how deep that change in beating speed was uh, as a function of the on-off frequency of the light. And what you see is that uh, in, the, in the blue uh, experimental data, there's a, a bell-shaped curve with a peak right around one or two uh, radian, radians per second. And it turns out to be very accurately given by essentially the Fourier transform of that little two-variable model that I just showed you in red. And it has the feature that it means the system is insensitive to low-frequency light changes, insensitive to high-frequency light changes, and most sensitive to light changes on the scale uh, of uh, frequencies that you see in purple here. Now, this is so it's a kind of uh, filter. And this is quite interesting because if you look at the orbital period of these spinning Volvox colonies as they age. When they're young, they're small and they spin rapidly. When they're old, they're large and they spin slowly, I suppose, like many of us. Uh, and what you see is that um, those uh, young colonies whose orbital periods fall in that very same shaded region um, are actually the ones that do accurate phototaxis. They can actually turn toward the light and uh, go where they need to go to do photosynthesis, and the old ones can't. And so the picture that emerges here is actually very simple. And I hope you can all see my hands as I demonstrate this. So as this colony is rotating around, essentially the dark side, when it rotates into the light and the beating dynamics is lowered, will rotate on a time scale that's approximately equal to this 
adaptation timescale so that while it's facing the light, the beating is low, but by the time it gets back into the dark side, the beating has recovered and is strong again. And effectively then, the dark side beats faster than the light side, and that's what makes you turn. So the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't require any discussion between all of the cells. Every single cell can be endowed with the same underlying program, namely an adaptive, an adaptive response in which the timescale of adaptation is tuned to the rotation frequency of the organism, and that is sufficient to make the entire thing work. So to make this mathematical, we can actually um, appeal to a result by one of the other GK Bachelor Prize winners, namely Howard Stone and uh, Samuel in a very nice paper they wrote many years ago using the reciprocal theorem to make a statement about the angular velocity of an object, let's say a sphere, that is uh, moving around subject to some fluid flow on its surface. So the angular velocity, which is what we need to know to understand how it turns, is in this case a contribution, first of all, from the fact that these organisms are bottom heavy. Uh, they have a, a, a unequal distribution of mass inside of them, so they're like a ship with a heavy keel, and there's a gravitational torque that will lead to a relaxation time associated with that bottom heaviness, where G is the gravitational direction and K is the axis of the organism. But most importantly, if I know the fluid velocity U everywhere and I integrate over the surface crossed with the normal vector, that will give me the contribution to turning. So what you can see, of course, is that if the velocity were the same everywhere, I wouldn't actually get any angular velocity out of it. But once I built this asymmetry into the two sides, then I can get a turn. And so we've used this kind of formulation along with the fact that if I'm, if I'm just a sphere and I'm watching a direction of light I, then it will evolve a solid body rotation to implement this adaptive model on, on the entire surface of a sphere. I'll spare you the mathematical details and just show you how it works. So I'll use a color coding in which blue represents strong beating and red represents uh, lowered beating. And here's the light direction. And when we start this video, everybody's happy, but immediately the, the side facing the light down regulates, the object turns, but as it turns, then all of the cells on the surface are bathed in light and they recover and they're happy because they're con under constant illumination conditions. And so there's a fixed point of the system facing the light and it all got there without any discussion between the organisms. So this is essentially like uh, phototropism. Plants grow toward the light because light inhibits growth and so the dark side grows faster. So it's very much the same kind of effect. And you can test whether this tuning of the adaptation time and the rotation time is necessary by actually changing the viscosity of the medium, slowing down the rotation of the organism but not affecting the adaptation time of the flagella. And what you discover is that as the rotational frequency of the organism is changed by increasing the viscosity, the phototactic ability drops like a rock, uh, consistent with this same kind of adaptive model that I've been describing. So I'm, I realize I'm going through this rather superficially, but the point I want to make is, is very simple, is that there's an adaptive dynamics tuned to the rotational frequency of the organism, and this is sufficient to allow a bunch of independent players to turn the sphere and swim toward the light. So now let's think a little bit about Chlamydomonas, which is really the place one should start, but it's not where we actually did start. So Chlamydomonas has these two flagella and it has an eye spot, which is sort of at its waist or at the equator. And so as it spins around its uh, central axis at a, a frequency, which is about two Hertz, then that little photo detector is going in and out of the light if the light is not aligned with the axis. Now the two flagella are known to be affected by the light signals that fall on the eye spot differently. They're called cis and trans for their placement relative to the eye spot. And the electrochemical triggers that happen when light falls on the eye spot affect the two of them differently. So one of them will beat stronger than the other when the light is stepped up or stepped down. So if the light is coming from the right, this is actually a rather complicated problem because the organism at one moment has the eye spot facing the light. And then it turns out the far side flagellum beats stronger. And then as it rotates half a rotation period uh, later, it's the other flagellum that's on the opposite, that's on the dark side. And it has to beat faster in order to continue this thing turning. So there's a very interesting dance involving the up and down regulation of the two flagella as, um, as it goes in and out of the light. But the important thing for what I wanna say is that there is a real separation of time scales between three fundamental processes. One is the beat period. These things beat at about 50 Hertz. So the beat period is 0.02 seconds. The body rotation half period is about a quarter of a second, so 10 times larger. And the time it takes to execute a phototactic turn is actually about 10 times larger than that, about two seconds. And we can exploit this separation to actually ask ourselves whether this same adaptation dynamics is actually playing a role here. And if so, how would we calculate anything? And I should point out a very recent paper by my former student, Kirsty Wan, 
uh, in PRL just uh, last few weeks that actually finally uh, explains exactly how this axial rotation occurs uh, in Clamidomonas. So we just take it as a given for the moment. And the way we can do the experiment is very, very similar to what I showed you before with Volvox. You have the organism on a micropipette, you turn the light on, and if you just trace the envelope of the flagellar beating, what you discover is that when the light turns on and triggers the eye spot response, one of the flagella reaches out further, has a much larger waveform, and will obviously, uh, ultimately, if it were a free organism, induce a turn. And if you look just at the, the areas of these two uh, envelopes of, of beating, you discover that it has exactly the same biphasic response that I showed you before. It's an adaptive dynamics with a fast response time and a much longer adaptation time. And the system resets and is ready for the next signal. So now if you put your theorist hat on and think, how am I going to, how am I going to use this adaptive dynamics to actually talk about the motion of the organism? Well, we're not going to just do it the same as Valvox because there are only two flagella here. There aren't thousands. But what we can do is realize that when there's this imbalance, it effectively induces rotational motion about the axis I previously called E1. So essentially, it's a torque that's balanced by the viscous rotational drag of, of a sphere, and that in introduces an angular velocity. So if you look back at the dynamical theory of Euler angles when it comes to describing rigid body rotation, you can basically say that our photoresponse function P modulated by some constant that's just a proportionality between p and, and angular velocities, actually enters into the dynamics of the three Euler angles of this rigid body in the following way. The two uh, angles that would describe the sort of geometric orientation relative to the light uh, are directly driven by p, by this uh, angular velocity. And the axial rotation is pretty much dominated by the spinning that comes from uh, what I described before with just a small correction from this. So what it means is that it's possible to solve this problem essentially exploiting the separation of time scales so that of the, during the many beats when the, this torque is acting, the actual orientation of the cell relative to the light has changed very little. And therefore you can construct essentially a kind of iterated map that describes how you move toward the light. But the crucial thing to say is that if you actually look at the gain of the response uh, the frequency response, the depth of this change in beating as a function of frequency, it again has this uh, resonance structure that is again tuned just about at the orbital frequency of, of the cell. So if you implement this um, uh, iterated map, what you, you can discover is that the angle at each half rotation period that the organism makes with respect to the light, where zero is at orthogonal to the light and pi over two is, is lined up, uh, obeys a, a very simple iterated map equation where at the n plus one uh, rotation, it is what it was before, plus some coefficient that varies slowly with n times cosine of that angle. And if you do this in the standard uh, cobwebbing diagram of dynamical systems, you can see if you start at zero, meaning orthogonal to the light, uh, and you cobweb along here, you go right into pi over two and you're attracted uh, to lining up along the light, purely as a consequence of this asymmetry uh, that is adaptive. And so you can actually animate this uh, iterated map. And so here's the organism facing 90 degrees to the light. And over time, as you see, it just lines up slower, 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 uh, and produces accurate uh, phototaxis just by this uh, adaptive dynamics now implemented in the language of the uh, angular velocity of the rigid body. Okay, so the next thing I want to say is that Okay, we've, we've got these two extremes. We've got Clamidomonas described at the level of two flagella. We've got Volvox at the level of thousands of flagella. There seems to be this common behavior of attuned resonance dynamics, but what about something in the middle? And so several years ago, I, I said to my then uh, postdoc, Hélène de Malaprade, the idea that we should study something like gonium. Uh, so here's a sequence of these green algae from Clamidomonas all the way up to Volvox. Do you see that nature is, is a mathematician? Nature has made for us uh, different species with two to the n um, cells arranged uh, in the case of the smaller uh, organisms as uh, flat sheets or slightly bent sheets, but eventually all the way up to Volvox, these are spheres of ever larger number. So we thought it would be interesting to study gonium, which is a, a 16 cell organism that's basically the shape of a, a, a flat plate, and, and to try to see how it does phototaxis. It doesn't have the high symmetry of the spherical colonies, and it's not as simple as, as Clamidomonas. Does it display the same behavior? This turned out to be a lot more complex than we thought, but eventually we got to the answer. So here's what gonium looks like up close. It's uh, held together by an extracellular matrix that you can see a little bit of in between here. And the flagella all 
stick out around the outside. It's about 40 microns across, which is, which is pretty big. And if you look very closely at it in terms of the orientation of the um, bases of these flagella, it turns out the cells on the outside are very much like uh, Volvox cells. They are two flagella beat like this, and they're oriented uh, sort of uh, radially around the outside. But the four cells in the center are like Chlamydomonas. They're flagella beat in this breaststroke fashion out of the plane. So it's some kind of hybrid of the two organisms. Here's a little picture of how it swims. It's kind of cute. It's a, it's a little swimming plate that uh, swims at uh, 50 microns a second, uh, rotates at about 0.4 hertz, and, uh, and actually exhibits nice helical uh, behavior. And if you um, uh, try to do a little phototaxis experiment. Uh, this was done uh, also in collaboration with uh, Frederick Moisey, who was visiting as a sabbatical visitor in my group. You can uh, take a collection of these and turn the light on on the right, and they all go there, and then switch it onto the left, and they all go there, and then turn it on the right, and they all go there. They're very highly phototactic, and you can really do a lot to understand how they execute this motion. But the most important thing is actually to just look at how the velocity around them responds to uh, changing light levels. So here's the organism held just from an edge. You can see the flagella here. We can do particle imaging velocimetry over time after we turn the light from off to on. And what you can see is there's a very strong asymmetry that's developed in the light flow. And if you plot the characteristic fluid speed in some region, you'll see that, again, it has this biphasic response. On the dark side, nothing much changes. But on the light side, there's a down regulation of the beating and then a recovery on the scale of about two seconds or so. And it also, it turns out that the flagellar frequencies themselves change uh, the, the cis and trans flagella on each individual cell pretty much in concert. So there we go. Uh, it turns out that in all three of these organisms, we have a, we have a tuning, uh, an adaptive response that involves two flagella of chlamydomonas, two edges of gonium as a, as a flat plate, or two hemispheres of volvox. And in each of these three cases, spanning from 10 microns to the better part of a millimeter, we have a tuning between the adaptation time and the orbital period. And that's what allows for accurate phototaxis. So I think, I don't have the answer for this, but I think that this raises a really general question about essentially control theory that it seems that nature has decided or realized uh, that the nulling out of an oscillatory signal is a very robust way to achieve a result. And I, I think maybe someone in the audience can, can help uh, us understand how this might have been a, a general feature in terms of evolutionary dynamics. And, and is it true, even from a control theory point of view, that this is, this is uh, robust and strong? Okay, so in the second half of my talk, I want to change gears and now talk about not light coming into organisms, but light going out of organisms. And this is about uh, dinoflagellate bioluminescence at the single cell level. Uh, this is work that was uh, very recently published last summer, primarily done by Mazi Jalal, uh, a postdoc now in Amsterdam, Nico Schrama, who was a visitor from Göttingen, Hélène, who uh, was a postdoc and is now in Marseille, Christoph Rofast, uh, a fantastic uh, sabbatical visitor from Nice, and Antoine Dode from Ecole Polytechnique. So the best way to start is just to show you a little movie. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with what happens if you go to the beach at night in certain areas of the world. There's beautiful music here. I don't know if you can hear it, but anyway, I'll talk over it. Uh, if you go to the beach at night and you watch breaking waves, as you see here in this Wadden Sea imagery um, uh, in, off the coast of Netherlands, the Netherlands, you'll see that as waves lap up against the rocks or against the beach, that there is this beautiful blue glow that occurs. Uh, it happens naturally like this, or if you actually walk along the beach and um, throw rocks in, you'll see the, the ripples that come out are this wonderful blue glow. Uh, if you step along the beach and stir up the water, it's this wonderful blue glow. It's everywhere, especially in Puerto Rico. There's a famous bay there where you can see this. And this bioluminescence, which is uh, sometimes given off by bacteria, but typically given off by other organisms called dinoflagellates, has been of interest to mankind for millennia. You can go back in the history of science to philosophers uh, around the turn of the last, the previous millennium, and, and find references to it. You can find uh, references uh, to work uh, to it by Robert Boyle, who was one of the first people who realized that bioluminescence requires oxygen, as he said, very much the same way that a burning piece of wood uh, does to keep glowing. Isaac Newton talked about it. Charles Darwin talked about it in his travels on the Beagle. But it wasn't until the last um, century that major understanding of the biochemistry of bioluminescence was achieved primarily due to the work of Edmund Newton Harvey at Princeton over many years, who elucidated the fundamental proteins at work giving rise to light production. Uh, 
And of course, this culminated in the development in the late uh, 20th century by Shimamura, Chalfi, and Sien of what is known as green fluorescent protein for use uh, lighting up everything in life. And I really love talking about this subject because I finally have something to talk to my cousin, Marty Chalfi, about when we meet. Uh, so what is known biochemistry about, biochemically about light production in these organisms is essentially the following. Inside the cell, uh, in the cell membrane of whatever organism we're talking about, there are receptors, which in some mysterious way, which is the subject of this talk, uh, sense shear stress, fluid motion outside the cell. And when they do that, they trigger the release of calcium stores inside the cell, either from, uh, either from storehouses in the cell or through channels in the membrane from the outside. That increase in calcium triggers an action potential, a voltage spike that travels along the membrane and in particular, it travels along a, uh, an object contiguous with the membrane known as a scintillon. This is basically a lipid bag vesicle uh, full of the biochemical juice that produces light. And in that soup uh, are two proteins, luciferin and luciferase. And they give off light in response to changes in pH and oxygen. And the pH change is induced by that voltage channel, voltage uh, change across the membrane that opens voltage gated proton channels and allows protons to flow in. So everything inside the cell is pretty much well established for many, many years. But what has not been clear is the origin uh, of the sensing of shear by cells. So in the service of this question, we decided to study this model organism. It's known as Pyrocystis lunula. It's about 150 microns across. It's a marine dinoflagellate, has this beautiful crescent moon shape set by a rigid cell wall, large volume of cytoplasm inside of it, cytoplasmic core containing the nucleus and all those scintillons that show up a characteristic color. And here we have it on a micropipette. And we thought it would be interesting to, to, to try to use modern technology to understand this issue of fluid triggered light production in a controlled way. Now, if I had to summarize all the prior work in this field, it would be easy because all I'd need is one word, LATS, for Michael Latz, a fantastic scientist at Scripps Institute in California, who over the course of many years, spanning almost two decades or more, uh, did an ever-increasing uh, bunch of experiments of greater sophistication to try to get a handle on this question. And we're really very much building on his work. So the first experiments that he did back in the mid-90s, which were beyond just bubbling air through a uh, liquid and watching what happened was to put these organisms in a cuet cell and rotate the inner or outer cylinder at wish to create a defined shear flow. And what he found was, as you see in the streaks, that you could trigger light production. Uh, and if you measured the intensity of light production as a function of the shear stress, uh, there was a very sharp turn on on this log log scale. And this gives you some idea of, of the scale and what's involved. So that's a very nice illustration on a microscopic level of, of uh, shear induced light production. Uh, things got more sophisticated uh, many years later in collaboration with physicists at San Diego in which uh, microfluidic channels were created that have the kind of structure you see here where a large rectangular channel gives rise to a very narrow constriction and opens up again. And these uh, dinoflagellates could be induced to flow along and get trapped right in the corner. And as you see in these pictures, if the fluid cascading past them were flowing fast enough, they will light up and you can do some calculations to, to understand the fluid flow pretty well. And so you can again, try to quantify the relationship between flow and light production. But the most interesting experiments were the, the most recent ones that he did, which is to use an atomic force microscope to actually push on these organisms. So you have a cantilever with a little sphere at the tip and you, you push on the organisms uh, and look at them from below. And you can see as you increase the force applied here measured in micronewtons, uh, how the light occurs. And what he discovered in these experiments was that it was not just a question of the force applied to the organisms, but also the rate at which the force was applied that determined the light production. Now, one of the difficulties of these experiments, you can appreciate you're, you're pushing with a cantilever on an organism and you're looking in the same line of sight as, as that pair. And so you can't really see what's happening to the cell membranes, but you do have some idea of the deformation, of course, that you've given. So we thought the logical thing was to go the next step and use micropipette technology to try to understand uh, this process. And in, in moreover, to not only control the, the forces, but even the deformations applied to the organism and the deformation rate. And so using micropipette technology, we could attach the micropipette to a computer controlled stage and move it at a specified velocity for a specified distance and, and quantify the two uh, uh, variables that are most important for these kinds of uh, studies. So here's just a simple experiment 
experimental uh, video to show you how you actually do this. So you suck a little fluid in and you can grab one of these uh, organisms uh, pretty easily on a micropipette. But again, we want to position these precisely. And so here's a, a better video showing you how this is done. So here's a, a micropipette and we suck an organism in. And as you see, it lights up when squeezed, just like I do, uh, and probably you do too. Uh, but if you now bring a second micropipette nearby, you can actually take the held lunula, lay it down on this, and with very gentle suction here, you can hold it there, and then you can gently nudge it into place uh, so that you can study it at will under defined conditions of fluid flow or other external forces. So the first experiment that we did was very simple, and this was done by Antoine Dodd. The idea was basically, can we in principle show that a submerged jet of fluid impinging on these uh, cells will cause them to light up. So we have Lunula held here with one micropipette. We have another micropipette some distance away injecting fluid at pretty high Reynolds numbers. Well, high for me at least, but these are uh, injection speeds of tens of centimeters per second coming out of this micropipette. So it's actually not so easy to calibrate the flow, but eventually you can do that. And to see whether we can get proof of principle that this works. So here's the, uh, the first uh, famous video in our group. Uh, so it's, it's dark so that you can see the light when it occurs. And there you go. You bring the micropipette across and poof, as soon as it impacts on the, on the cell, it lights up. That little bit hanging off here is just dirt. So that's, uh, that's good, but it's, it's not as controlled as we'd like. So here's the next generation of this. Here's uh, the lunula with a, gray, a green line indicating the cell membrane uh, in its undeformed state. And here's a micropipette above with just a glass blob on the tip that is um, injecting fluid. And as we, uh, and this is a high-speed video, as we inject uh, faster and faster, you'll start to see the membrane of the organism uh, deform. Remember, this is about 150 microns across. And at some point, you start to see it light up. And as you push further and further, it lights up more and more. So this is, this is really exciting because we're, we're linking an observable deformation of the cell wall uh, to the light production. Now, you'd like to try to make, put some numbers here. It's a little bit hard to, to uh, just back of the envelope calculate what's going on here, but you can just imagine you have a micropipette uh, injecting fluid out and do some finite element calculations of just say the, the flow that you actually get on the sphere and under the realistic geometry that we have. And you could look at the, the, the scale of the stress uh, on uh, the surface of this sphere as a function of distance uh, along the surface. And what you can see from this is that the scale of stress is something like uh, uh, 10 to 100 pascals. And if you just look at the typical energy density in, in the fluid row you squared, well, that's what you get. So that's, that's the, the starting point. This is a high Reynolds number flow. We don't have to worry too, too much about viscosity at the moment. We can just focus on, on this scale of stress. And if there's some characteristic lateral size psi over which we're uh, deforming the membrane, then the scale of forces would just be rho u squared times uh, psi squared. And that turns out to be about up to 10 to the minus seven Newtons. So from our experiments, where we do many, many studies of uh, the threshold fluid flow necessary to light up the cell, we can get this uh, probabilistic distribution of the scale of forces about a 10th of a micronewton. Uh, to do so, and that's consistent with Latz's uh, previous observations. So now we have two ways in principle to do the experiment. We can do controlled fluid flow uh, impinging on one of these organisms and we can watch the deformation, or the better way actually is to have a second micropipette that comes into contact with the organism and with which we can push into the organism a defined distance, delta, and we can control the rate we deform things, delta dot, and that's a little bit closer to what you would expect from a sort of uh, you know, solid body mechanics point of view. You control the deformation and the rate of deformation. And you can get a, a shape of the deformed uh, cell wall, which is rather similar to what you get with the fluid jet. So here's a, a little back of the envelope calculation. Uh, take it with a grain of salt. We've got our scale of energy density, rho u squared. The elastic energy of a cell wall, roughly speaking, would be an integral over the surface of the square of the mean curvature times a bending modulus. And the force that would come from that would look like the modulus times the Laplacian squared of the deformation field zeta. And the deformation zeta could be thought of as, as its central displacement and with this Laplacian squared divided by psi to the fourth, our lateral scale to the fourth. The elastic modulus of the cell should look like the Young's modulus of the material times the cube of the thickness of the membrane. And we know that, and we know roughly the Young's modulus from Latz's work. So if we wanted to estimate as a sanity check that the deformation amplitude divided by the lateral scale is sensible, and that's a measure of the slope of the deformation, we just take 
uh, force balance between these two. It looks like rho u squared over e, which it turns out to be related to a Mach number, but that's that's not for anything other than humor, uh, divided by the uh, multiplied by the cube of the ratio psi over h. And we know all these numbers, and we get an we get a number of about 0.1 to 1, which is what we expect and what we see experimentally. So this is a at least a scaling argument for what's going on. So now, if we do this experiment, what we see is we can push and we can trigger light production. And then there's a bit of adhesion between the micropipette and the cell wall. So when we pull out, uh, we also get light production, as you'll see in a second. And you can go back and forth and back and forth and, and trigger this at will. So we want to try to make some sense of, of all of this uh, quantitatively. So if you look at the time course of repeated pushings on one of these cells, you'll see that you get spikes of light, which gradually decrease over time as you use up the sort of biochemical juice on the inside. But if you think of this more like a dynamical system where we plot uh, the time rate of change of the intensity, the IDT versus I for each of these uh, spikes, you see this kind of loopy structure, you go up and come back down. And the last part of each uh, spike, of course, you have DIDT looks like minus I, that's just exponential decay. But interestingly, for every spike, uh, you see the same loopy structure, it just gets smaller and smaller. Now, if you just focus on the first spike for each experiment, and, and there are hundreds that we've done, and you plot the IDT versus I, for a fixed rate of indentation and variable depth of indentation, you also see this loopy structure. And if you now go and do the opposite and you fix the, the amplitude of the deformation and change the rate, you see this loopy structure. And if you scale everything DIDT by its maximum and I over its maximum, it's a bit noisy, but you see this kind of quasi-universal loop. And we wanted to try to understand that. And the first step was, well, how do you describe a flash? So what we're seeing is something that is, is sort of viscoelastic. And, and so I'm going to tell you that it's actually possible to think of each flash pretty much in the same adaptive dynamics that I described to you before, where now the variable we previously called P for the photoresponse is actually the light intensity. But the signal that triggers all of this seems to be, in a sense, uh, dependent on not only the rate of deformation, but also the deformation itself. So the simplest picture is a Maxwell one, where the time rate of change of the signal that's triggering the light production and the signal itself are uh, added together with a time constant tau e uh, proportional to the um, time rate of change of the deformation. So depending upon the scale of tau e, you either has, have the deformation Sorry, the signal goes like the deformation rate or the signal dot goes like the deformation dot. And that's the characteristic feature of a, of a viscoelastic system. So if we put that as the input to a flash where the intensity is triggered by the signal and there's hidden biochemistry that resets it, then we're back to the same kind of dynamics as before. And it turns out that that gives exactly the loopy structure that we see in experiment. So if you plot uh, the signal as a function of time, let's say if you just ramp up, you get this spike of intensity that's, that's like the spike that we see experimentally and the hidden variable has accommodated to this and everything has reset. And in this phase portrait, you get exactly that loopy structure. So if we put this together in the way that's possible to compare to experiment, we have the following, that experimentally the light intensity scales such that at low deformation rates and low deformations, there's very little. At high deformation amplitude, but low rates, there's little. At high deformation rates and low amplitude, there's little. Only when the two of them are large do we actually get uh, a large signal. And this is exactly what comes out of this very simple Maxwell model coupled to this flash dynamics using that same adaptive description that I gave you before. So in the future, what we need to understand is, is mechanistically, mechanically, what is the origin of this viscoelasticity in the cell wall or in the membranes inside the cell? But at least we kind of have a framework to try to understand the, the quantitative behavior of the flashes. And we have an experimental system where we can actually probe quite precisely the, uh, the triggering dynamics. And so I'll close with just this graph, which, which I think raises more questions than it answers, but it's, a, it's an attempt to put together on one slide all the experiments that have been done to date on this problem. So Michael Latz's AFM experiments in the scale of perturbation stress and perturbation size sit way up here, very large forces, very small size. The macroscopic experiments uh, in a Quetz cell, for instance, involve very large perturbation area because it's the entire cell, uh, but very low forces to achieve light production. And we're exactly in the middle. And so interestingly, apparently you can get light by pushing a small region very hard or tickling the entire cell very gently. And we think that this has an interesting uh, 
ecological and perhaps uh, communal uh, significance when it comes to trying to understand the real purpose for these organisms of bioluminescence. And so I'll close there. I hope these stories have been interesting to you. And I'll just uh, finish by reminding you that, uh, as we heard from Juan Santiago before, uh, there's this new journal, Flow. Oh, everything I described here is already published, so I can't say uh, it, it should go into Flow, but it, it would have been the perfect kind of thing to go into Flow, where we're using basic fluid mechanical ideas to try to understand something about nature. Thank you. Um, there have been various questions coming in. I hope we're going to uh, have time for most of them as we go through. Um, so far, they're mostly on the first part of your talk, and I'll kick off with this one. Um, it's about your hidden variable in the model. Um, the question is, how is that uh, quantified if it's a hidden variable? <laughs> well, so um, it's not, it, let me just say that we know, for instance, in the case of phototaxis, that there's an awful lot of biochemistry associated with the internal, basically electrochemical signaling that goes on. Um, it has to do with um, calcium dynamics, it has to do with um, the dynamics of internal membranes and other such things. So we're essentially lumping that all together and saying there is some internal process, very much like an action potential, which resets the system. So one possibility to quantify this is actually to do real-time visualization of the internal calcium levels in the system as the photo process is occurring. And there are calcium dyes, reporters of one sort or another, which in principle can uh, reveal this. The trick is that the timescales we're dealing with are so fast that it's not clear you have enough signal to noise to actually see it. But that would be a good example. Um, we've tried to estimate characteristic timescales in terms of the scale of the cell and the diffusion times or, or, or active transport process times uh, for, uh, for these uh, supposed biochemical players. And you can get a rough estimate that's sort of consistent with what we see, but it's, it's very much unclear. We know there's an adaptive, adaptive timescale. We just really don't understand microscopically what it is, but calcium is the likely player. So, so that seems to be an example of trying to discover the hidden variable. But I suppose in terms of what you showed us today, the hidden variable is just something, um, but it, it's, it's not your primary observable. Well, the, it's something we, that's allowing you to understand. The, yes, the, the, the for us, observable. for us, the important thing is there is an adaptive time scale. You can see it, uh, and uh, and this. So this little two variable system is just the simplest encoding of what we see, and it it leads to the prediction that there's a essentially a, a bandpass filter in the system, and so if you want, it's it's just a statement that there's a second time scale. Um, yeah. Good. And then interesting extension, perhaps. Um, can your sort of Volvox equation, that same sort of model equation, I guess, with the hidden variable, uh, can that be used as a controlling equation for nano robots? Well, it's funny you say this because um, one of the things that uh, Knut tried when he was a PhD student here, uh, it was partially successful, but it was it was pretty ambitious. Was could we build a robot, macroscopic robot, a swimming robot that would actually do this. And mm -hmm. so with uh, help from our machine shop in the GK Bachelor Lab, uh, we, we had these, these little spheres that had um, uh, controllable fluid jets that could, in principle, uh, respond to light and move around. And so I think something like that probably could be done. Uh, absolutely. Um, I was just talking to Itai Kohn at, at Cornell uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, they're doing amazing things with microfabrication, nanofabrication mm -hmm. of, of tiny robots. And so I could see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of your equation, I suppose, I mean, in some sense, the equation itself is the sort of control feedback yes. uh, type of equation that would go into robotics, um, but you're using to, to try to understand something fundamental about the, right. the biological system. Yeah, I should say that um, uh, those who studied this kind of dynamics in bacterial chemotaxis are, are able to say much more about these other variables because they're uh, the, the pathways of chemical signaling and response are known in exquisite detail, all the systems biology of uh, feedback loops and things like that. So there, you don't have to just guess. I guess one, uh, the next question, I guess, relates to um, a experimental setup and, and things you have to worry about. Um, and that is, does the wool shear in the microfluidic channels that you're using uh, affect the motion or the behavior of the organisms? Yeah, so, so one of the tricky things um, 
is, uh, of course, with the use of micro pipettes, you have, you have, you're holding the object, so there's a force acting on it, and you have to be mm -hmm. careful about how you interpret things because it's not the, exactly the same as the free swimming ones. You do, you do have to worry about it and compare and control. And then indeed, you have to worry about the presence of the wall. However, the advantage of the micro pipette technology is that you can position yourself where you wish uh, in, your, in your chamber and, and be confident that you're far enough away from walls, if you desire that, uh, to avoid any, any wall effects. Uh, so the micropipette itself is usually more of an issue, uh, but we can we can calibrate for that and understand it. Uh, but the wall one you can take care of uh, just by virtue of. In fact, the, the problem is it's hard to get too close to the wall because of the micropipette. And then a, a question about causality, uh, perhaps. Um, so I think what you described was the uh, photo response relaxation time being tuned to the rotation time. And um, why is it that way round rather than uh, the other way? <laughs> um, well, I, oh, and, a, and here's, here's the question: Is just come on? Come yes, on that's a very it. good point. I I I always phrase it one it's way, awesome. but but I, perhaps yeah, perhaps you're right. You could say that um, uh, that the uh, one came before the other. It really gets to the origins of of the eukaryotic uh, flagellum or cilium. Uh, you know, at what point did it become something? interesting from a motility point of view, at what point did phototaxis? So I don't know the answer to that, and that's a very good point. What I can say is that um, the somatic cells of Valvox are possessed of the same genetic, essentially the same genetic material as, um, of, as Chlamydomonas. In fact, Valvox has been sequenced about a decade ago, and so it's possible to actually look at you know, the very small differences between the two and try to understand many aspects of this problem. But but the adaptive behavior has been adapted in the case of Volvox uh, to work just a little bit differently. So it's not the two flagella are fundamentally different. It's, it's they're all the same, but on when they're in the dark and when they're in the light, they are changing. I don't know exactly what the missing link steps are toward that, but that's one of the reasons why studying something like gonium is really interesting because what you see is Fundamentally, it's, it's the architectural placement of the flagella and their orientation relative to each other. In Volvox, they go like this. In Chlamydomonas, they go like this. Uh, and in the peripheral cells of, of gonium, they go like Volvox. And in the central ones, they go like Chlamydomonas. So it's this missing, it's this halfway in between thing. And uh, further studies of their flagella dynamics could reveal whether the Chlamydomonas ones have a clammy like response, et cetera, that, that we need to see. Tim, did I convey things adequately, or was there more to you? <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to make it clear that that was from me, and I, uh, I, I was interested in the answer. Thanks very much, Ray. Sure. <laughs> so, the question is: Is there an analogy between chemotaxis and phototaxis? I mean, well, yes, one of course uh, yes being and no. related um, to gradients in chemical concentration. But... Yeah. So that that's an interesting point. In fact, some models of phototaxis tend tend to use gradients of light, I mean, these are theoretical constructs, you use gradients mm -hmm. of light. And uh, that doesn't make much sense to me because, because it's basically a direct line of sight to something and you respond to that. Um, now, and, and also, of course, light doesn't have the same kind of diffusing d dynamics as, uh, as um, the biochemicals that produce sure. chemotaxis. And so th at the same time, there are some organisms which do a spiral motion in the odor plume from a source. And by doing that, they're moving in and out of the high and low concentration regions you know, on a scale which is much larger than the very small scales we're talking about here. So I think there is a way to understand the two. There's some biological work in Chlamydomonas suggesting that the chemo response and the photoresponse have some common biochemical pathways inside the cell. And certainly from a phenomenology point of view, this adaptive behavior is identical in the two. Uh, it, it, obviously the timescales are different, but, but the fundamental adaptive dynamics are the same. So it might be convergent evolution that nature just keeps latching onto this as a way of solving a problem. But remember in the case of phototaxis, it's fundamentally uh, about periodic signals. And in chemotaxis, it's usually not. In some cases, yes, but usually not. So there was no following of a gradient field in anything you showed us today. That was uh... there isn't, but there's one thing that that is important to realize, which is when, when you when you do experiments, let's say in a chamber on a microscope stage, you've got a shaft of light coming up or down from your illumination source, typically, and, and the cells will swim, you know, to the brightest spot. Mm -hmm. Now you think, well, 
what, what are they seeing? I mean, when, when they weren't anywhere in the illumination, how did they know to go there? And, and the answer, I think, is, is that the other stuff in there scattered light. And they are seeing, maybe from their fellow Thymidomonas, they are seeing light being scattered by others and responding to that. So I think there's a possibility that there's a gradient climbing. Um, or at least some aspect of this is associated with scattering from other things in, in solution, which is allowing them to avoid necessarily having to see a direct line of sight to the, to the light source. And then I hope I'm interpreting this question correctly, but uh, how would a, an ellipsoidal uh, bacterium rotate? You think, how, how might that? It rotate in what context? I'm not sure, uh, but well, uh, Jeffrey, I wonder whether, Jeffrey taught whether us the how shape, because you, <laughs> yes, <laughs> rotate. You, um, you talked to us, to us about spheres and ah, the platelets, but so yeah. to what extent is the geometry of the bacterium important? I think that's what's underlying. So I think, the I think bacterium might have been used erroneously here. We're talking about oh, algae, but sorry, that's okay. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Um, so, so actually, I think the swimming plate is is at least for these algae, it's the one non spherical uh, geometry that, that there is, um, you can coerce these things to have strange geometries by growing them packed together, like, you know, those square tomatoes that are grown by packing them all mm -hmm. together. Um, I don't know of any ellipsoidal ones here. However, um, there are other organisms in the world like paramecium, which are more prolate ellipsoids and things like that. And, um, and of course, they'll have the standard kind of Jeffrey orbit dynamics in, in shear flow. I should say that bacteria also can bioluminesce. Um, and it's a different kind of dynamics than the dinoflagellates. And, and, and it, it's actually, we're, we're studying this at the moment, they are more ellipsoidal. And the question of how the bioluminescence is triggered by shear flows for them is, is a really, really interesting one because of that tumbling dynamics in the shear flow. Yeah. Thank you. And then final question, I think. Um, so will there be any uh, thermal fluctuations, you know, given that you're, you're forcing these systems using light, is there any thermal effect associated with that? Uh, well, if by thermal, membranes? you mean heating, um, I think the answer is not in the way of heating because these are, you know, even when you focus a laser, you're, uh, with most typical powers, you're not going to get much heating because the thermal diffusivity of water is so high. Right. But uh, it, so in, in most of what we're dealing with, this is unfocused light. And so I don't think there's a heating effect. Um, but uh, but also the, in terms of generic thermal fluctuations of the kind of equipartition kind, um, we're talking about things which are fairly large. I mean, the dinoflagellates are really large. Uh, and so I don't think there's too much to worry about there. The cell walls are rather rigid. And so there aren't too many thermal fluctuations when it comes to the, uh, the membranes themselves. But I can't rule that out. Good. Well, I think we'll stop there. Ray, thank you very much for a, a perfectly wonderful talk and for answering uh, a, a range of questions that it inspired. Um, I think this has been uh, in, enormously interesting uh, for a lot of people. I've certainly enjoyed it. And thank you for, for getting the, the show off the ground. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the meeting now that I can relax. <laughs> Good. Thanks very much. Okay.